the great paradox of the ocean is that while the energy is at the top, a lot of the stuff, the nutrients that you need to create life have drifted down into the deep water. So you've got this separation. So the ocean should be dead. So let's start with what the ocean is. So the first thing is the ocean is structured. It's not just a big pond that's all the same. And um, just as one example of this, like we'll see, it's a bit, bit probably a bit hard. Does anyone know what that is? Anyone want to shout out? Greenland shark, yes, top points to whoever got that. Um, it is a Greenland shark. It's basically a baggy jumper pretending to be a shark. It lives in very cold polar waters. Uh, it lives very, very slowly. It's currently, uh, it's one of the oldest known large animals living. It's thought to live to 450 years old. Doesn't reach sexual maturity till it's 150. Um, and it grows very, very slowly. It swims a few centimeters per second. Um, in spite of swimming incredibly slowly, it's found with seals and much faster fish inside it. No one's ever seen it catch anything, but it clearly eats, at least occasionally. They're really interesting creatures. But the reason that they can live really slowly is because they live in really cold water. And, you know, the speed of life kind of goes with the temperature. So, so that's why they can live for so long. Now, so they normally live up in the poles. So if you can, for those who can see, this is a uh, map of the planet. We've got Europe, we're up here, Africa's down there, Greenland's up there. And um, the, t the ocean here, the temperature is given by the color. So the dark blues up here are very cold water. The reds down here are very warm water. Um, so up here, this is where you'd normally find a Greenland shark, up near Greenland, as you'd expect, really cold water. Um, but around 2013, there was a, uh, a boat, a research boat down here in the Gulf of Mexico, and they were researching uh, the outcomes of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So they were, uh, they were analyzing the ecology in this area. And the water temperature, the, so look at the bright red there, this is 30 degrees C. And they put down a hook, you know, that's how they were doing their survey. And from 2000 kilometers down, they pulled back this fish on deck and it was a juvenile Greenland shark. And that sounds ridiculous. It looks ridiculous when you look at this map. What is a cold water creature doing here when the temperature here is 30 degrees? What I did tell you about this map is that this is a map of surface temperature only. And actually, deeper down where the shark was, the water was much cooler. So one of the things, just like the most basic thing about the structure of the ocean is that it has layers, that actually the top of the ocean is a kind of warm lid. It's just water, there's no actual boundary, but you've got warmer water, um, what's known as the, the mixed layer floating on top and much, much colder water beneath. Um, and so actually what happened in the Gulf of Mexico was that even though the shark, even though the boat up here was in 30 degree water, down here where the shark was found, it was only four degrees C, almost at the equator. Um, and so this is just the most basic sort of structure of the ocean. And the, the point of this is that it isn't all mixed up. The water has different characteristics in different places. The ocean has anatomy. And so they, although they were a bit surprised to find the shark there, uh, they weren't completely astonished. It, I mean, it, it, had, it was slightly warmer than normal, but it wasn't completely um, out of where it should be. How it was feeding itself is anybody's guess. So the ocean is also dynamic. Now, one of the things are that, you know, I've been talking about physics for years and um, it's always struck me that uh, biologists, it was unfair because biologists could always talk about cats and dolphins and everyone is immediately interested in cats and dolphins. But, you know, fluffy eyes, cute tricks, everyone loves it. And physics, you, there's no, you know, dolphins in physics. Um, and then I came to talking about the ocean and I discovered that the ocean has its equivalent. It does have a few dolphins. Far more interesting to people is the poo. Talk about poo for hours. And um, so I want to tell you about this poo here, but because it came about because of the ocean, but I want to um, take a step back, take you to a different part of the world first. So this is a map of South America here. It's got um, a current running up the side of it here that is called the Humboldt Current because of the guy who first observed it. This is Alexander von Humboldt. There's a very good book uh, written about him by Andrew Wolf a few years ago called The Inven uh, Invention of Nature. He was a proper polymath. Um, anyway, so he went sailing uh, and he, he found this current and he also found that it's much colder than you'd expect. This is a temperature map of the planet and here's the nice warm water near the equator. You can see that up here where the Humboldt current is coming, it's much colder than you'd think it should be. There's this weird cold water thing going on up here. Um, so anyway, uh, this current, this area here where this current is, this is one of the most productive fisheries in the world. Today, 20% of the world's fish catch 
come from there. Back in, I think the, I can't remember, quite remember the dates, but I think around the 1960s, it was 40% of the global fish catch just came from this one small place here. So there's this question, right? I mean, is it just they've got very enthusiastic fishermen there or is something else going on? And it's the second one, something else is going on. Um, and this is what they catch in that area. They're Peruvian anchoveta. The reason you haven't seen them on your chips is that even the enthusiasts for these fish uh, write about their tastes with words like bold and you know apparently it's quite an it's quite an overpowering fish but it's got lots of protein so um so just a, a, um, a timeline of these anchoveta um so there's this interesting thing that between 1950 for the next 25 years fish harvests tripled like the amount of fish we were pulling out of the ocean tripled but the amount of that that humans were eating stayed pretty much exactly the same. And what they were doing with it, the rest of it, was turning it into fish meal. So a fish is a beautiful answer to the question of how do you live in the ocean, right? Um, it's, it's a beautiful piece of evolutionary engineering. It's, it's got all these ingenious things in it. And fish meal is all of that dried and ground up and put into a big pile of, made into a big pile of brown stuff like this. And, but it's really rich in protein. And so in 1960, this was being fed to pigs, specifically pigs in Britain. Uh, so P Peru was making an enormous amount of money selling fish meal to Britain and Britain was feeding it to the pigs. And um, th so this was, you know, 1964, Peru got caught 40% of the entire global fish harvest and half of that was going to feed British pigs. And of course, what happens if you haul stupid quantities of fish out of the ocean is that eventually the fish run out. So 1972 is a population crash and the price of British bacon doubled overnight. Um, and so the question you have to ask is, what is all of this doing there, right? Why is it there? Why are there all these fish? And why can't the British just feed their pigs with their own fish, right? Um, and it's because the ocean is doing something very interesting in that location. So I said there's this kind of uh, layers to the ocean. There's a warm layer on top, there's cooler stuff underneath. There's a great paradox to ocean life, which is that the sunlight is up at the top. You know, and you need energy, you need two things to have life. You need energy and you need fuel. So the sunlight is at the top, all the energy is at the top, doesn't go very far in. But what tends to happen to life, anything that's alive, is it's more dense than water. So it may rotate, it may sort of move around the top and get mixed in surface layer, recycled a lot. But generally it's on its way down. Anything that goes down isn't coming back up. So the great paradox of the ocean is that while the energy is at the top, a lot of the stuff, the nutrients that you need to create life have drifted down into the deep water. So you've got this separation. So the ocean should be dead, except that it isn't. Because in some places in the world, what happens is that top layer gets broken. You can break the paradox. Um, and on that coast there where the Humboldt current is, what's happening is that the, the action of the wind is pushing the top layer offshore. So the nutrient rich water from underneath can come up and then you've got both nutrients and sunlight and then you get the most productive fishery in the world. So the point is that the ocean, there's a thing going on in the ocean engine, a, a paradox is being broken and that is what gives you a place where you have lots of fish. It's not just that happen to be fish there, it's that there's something is happening underneath to give the fish a place where they can live. Um, and, and so this feature is the reason that the, Peruvian, that the Humboldt current is such um, a, rich, a rich source of food. It doesn't stop there because we've got to get to the birds. Now, um, when, let's go a bit further back in time, early 1800s, when uh, Humboldt first discovered his currents, his sailing in that area, um, there are some rocks that uh, poke up out of the Humboldt current and they are covered uh, in birds. Well, these are Peruvian burby, boobies and uh, birds, you know, they go out, they fly out to sea, they catch their fish. There's lots of fish, so the, the birds have loads of fish. They come back and then they poo because that's what birds do. And it turns out that this poo is spectacularly rich in, it's a really good fertilizer. And so the natives in that area before the Westerners turned up, marshaled the resources, they took very small quantities, they looked after it. And then Humboldt comes along, he takes some of this white powder, he goes, oh, this is interesting, takes it back to the UK, they do a chemical analysis, discover it's amazing fertilizer, full of uh, phosphate, um, and then they start taking it to Britain to feed, to fertilize land. So this is before the P Peruvians. Uh, so in the 1850s, half of Peru's guano, they, they started mining this stuff. The Western powers started mining this stuff, brought it to England as fertilizer. And what did England do with it? Um, turnips, fertilized turnips with it. 
So Baldrick managed to grow his prize turnip without uh, the, pro the help of the Peruvian booby. But just imagine how much bigger it would have been if he'd had the help of the birds. But there's a question here, which is that if, you know, England's got lots of birds, why is it that we we've got presumably the birds in this country produce a similar amount of poo per bird? So why are we not using our own bird poo to, you know, grow turnips? Um, and this is also due to the Humboldt current, the cold water that is at the surface where, where the Humboldt current is, where there's this enormous productivity. That cold water basically stops it raining. So the bird poo doesn't wash away and it doesn't get chemically changed. And then you've got this very valuable resource. And that's become about, it's not random. It's not there's just some island in the ocean. It's because the ocean has created a physical structure that then allows life to exist in it in a certain way. And that's the sort of thing that affects history and geography and human civilizations. Um, and in this case, um, it wasn't just that good as fertilizer, it was good to make explosives with. And so in 1856, and this is still in American law, uh, they passed, the US passed the, uh, the Guano Islands Act, which incredibly said that enables citizens of the United States to take possession of, in the name of the United States, of unclaimed islands containing guano deposits. Uh, and guano is the uh, Quechua word, guanu, for, for bird poo. Uh, so this is incredibly important geopolitically, but it happened in that place because of a feature in the ocean. And the ocean is full of features like that. It's got its, it's, got its rainforests and its deserts, its meadows and its woodlands. They just don't look the same, but they're there because the ocean engine and these different water packets have moved around each other and given it a structure. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.